Good morning, and thank you for joining us at Winship Grand Rounds this morning. If you are an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive CME credit for this attendance, the login information is 353806 and can be found in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen for our virtual attendees. If you have any issues with the webinar or the CME login, please send Maggie Johns an email. This morning, we are pleased to welcome Deepakar Devar, who is currently Associate Professor of Medicine at University of Pittsburgh, the Clinical Director for the Melanoma and Skin Cancer Program at UPMC Hillman, and the PI of the Melanoma and Skin Cancer Spore. Dr. Devar is also a member of the Cancer Immunology and Immunotherapy Research Program at UPMC. After his brief delay at the airport last night for the Atlanta storms, he arrived safely. Dr. Devar is a board certified in internal medicine and medical oncology. He received his medical degree from the National University of Singapore and completed his residency and fellowship training at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where he served as chief resident and chief fellow. During his fellowship training, he also received a master's in clinical research. He specializes in the management of cutaneous malignancies, including melanoma and cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, along with the development of early phase studies to test novel immunotherapeutic approaches to treat advanced cancer. He's an exceptional translational and clinical oncologist, and he has a deep understanding of immunotherapy and has a steadfast commitment to the concept that cancer immunotherapy can improve survival of our cancer patients, particularly those with cutaneous malignancies. His work has demonstrated that changing the gut microbiome should transform the response of patients with advanced melanoma to immunotherapy from those who have never responded to those who do. We welcome Dr. Devar to Winship, and we look forward to hearing about the intestinal microbiome and cancer immuno immunology and some pretty good poop jokes. Thank you, Dr. Harper, for being here. Um, so can everybody hear me okay? All right. Uh, so thank you for this very kind invitation uh, to speak. Uh, I do have <clears throat> a nearly infinite store of poop jokes. And the best thing about these meetings is that they almost always serve people food. So I look forward to trying to see how many of you don't gag. Uh, one slight correction, I am not the SPORE PI. Uh, I'm actually one of the co-investigators in the SPORE. I'm the P, uh, PI of uh, Project 2, but the SPORE PI at the University of Pittsburgh is uh, Hassan and John. These are my disclosures. So. Um, um, my uh, practice and translational research interest focuses on several key areas in immune therapy. And uh, in cutaneous malignancies, we have been very blessed. And the reason we've been blessed is because uh, our patients historically, uh, when I started doing this, which was in about 2005, 6, 7, and 8, um, when I graduated medicine, uh, had a very poor outcome. And that has really been transformed by the advent of really two fundamental therapies. First is checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and the second is uh, T-cell-based therapy, and to some extent also by targeted therapy. And we know that because when you look at the PFS, the progression-free survival uh, of these patients uh, based on who have received these therapies, it has been transformed from 8% all the way until 36% with combination checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And we expect that with the development of the first T-cell product uh, in immune, uh, or immune for the treatment of patients with advanced metastatic melanoma, probably in about six months, that this will be further extended because this has efficacy even in highly refractory patients. Uh, and this is you know, clearly translated into some tremendous results, right? So this is a graph from CRI website. And what's kind of crazy about this is that the number of trials that are happening in checkpoint inhibitor <clears throat> with checkpoint inhibitors exceed the number of patients in the United States. So the idea is that if you open a trial right now, you know, you better have a plan on how you're going to finish it because it, it ain't happening by itself. Uh, we have more trials than patients. But what we have done is we've reduced the death rate. So this is actually quite fundamental because for the first time in recorded history, primarily, as you can see, in actually melanoma and lung cancer, the national death rates have actually reduced over time, primarily because we have now have effective treatments that produce durable cures for patients with advanced cancer. Um, unfortunately, our biomarkers are still somewhat limited. So when we think of what we use to try to decide who benefits, uh, in melanoma particularly, we don't actually have any good biomarkers. We can sort of tell you who's going to do well based on something known as the T-cell inflammatory gene expression profile, which is basically the density of T-cells along with some other transcripts. Um, and we've got, we know that uh, tumor mutation burden is something that is associated with gene expression profiling and really looks at the proportion of non-synonymous uh, mutations within the tumor. But all our biomarkers are primarily based on, firstly, therefore, the adaptive host response, 
but also a tumor intrinsic factor. And we have neglected up until relatively recently to think of another aspect that can, and it clearly is associated with response to immunotherapy, and that is uh, the human microbiome. So the human microbiome, you know, there are several, there are a lot of misnomers about this, you know, the, the idea that you're mostly non-human and all these other analogies, but the short answer is that uh, the gut microbiome contains many, 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 many bugs. It's on the order of about 100 trillion, which is a very large number. And these microorganisms are to, the large, uh, to a large extent, uh, either just um, very few of them are pathobionts, meaning that they don't actually cause harm. The vast majority of them are actually cobionts. And a very significant number are actually symbionts, which means that we've inherited them. They do good things. Getting rid of them is probably a bad thing. And a classic example for that is vitamin K production. So humans were never designed to be able to produce vitamin K. Uh, we have bacteria that can do that. Uh, dietary supplementation increases that. We are therefore facultatively requiring uh, these organisms to be able to produce that. And uh, what we have known for about uh, 15 years or so is that the human gut microbiome actually does play a role in the development of anti-cancer response. And I'll tell you guys a little bit about that. So with my questions when I first started doing all of this was, uh, how does this work, right? So how does the gut microbiome, the composition of the gut microbiome affect response to therapy? Are there different pieces of data that you can gather in aggregate to show this? Now, firstly, obviously this has been, can be demonstrated in preclinical models and it has been done. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, but then I'll also tell you a little bit about the work that we have done. So the first piece of evidence that we have is that antibiotics appear to be bad, right? So in preclinical models, if you give uh, mice antibiotics and give them checkpoint inhibitor therapy concurrently, you can ablate uh, anti-tumor immune responses to some extent. In humans, this has been replicated by many people, including uh, data from our group. And basically what you can do is you can look at patients who are receiving antibiotics and you can show that uh, they tend to do a little worse. And this, this has now been published at the meta-analysis level. There are obviously many confounders with human data. People who are sicker tend to get more antibiotics. So you can't, it's very hard in meta-analyses to confound for the fact that people are sick. But that said, that association is quite Start. And what we also know is that this is not just checkpoint inhibitor dependent. So there's a recent paper from Penn uh, in, in, in the same edition of Nature Medicine where we published our data, and antibiotic use also adversely affects the outcome to anti-CD19 CAR T uh, in data from Marco Ruella and um, in the Penn group. Um, the second sort of key piece of evidence is you are what you eat to some extent, right? So um, key macronutrients, uh, particularly fiber, uh, appear to affect uh, the impact of checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So this is data from uh, Jen Walgo's group. This is a paper that was in Science uh, uh, last year, uh, two years ago. And what they did was they looked at fiber intake. Now, again, this is based on retrospective dietary recall. Uh, so they're not exactly the world's most accurate way of telling people how much they eat. You know, much like exercise, people tend to overestimate what good they do and underestimate how much bad they do. Uh, but if you'd use a food frequency questionnaire such as the DHQ3, you can quantitatively assess what people are eating. So they did that, and they were able to show that there's an association with fiber. Uh, and the same thing has been shown both with fiber and fermented foods by uh, Justin Sonnenberg um, at um, Stanford. And what Justin was able to do was look at both fiber and fermented foods and show that high fiber creates distinct taxonomic changes, particularly in enzymes that are associated with uh, the firmicutus class, uh, but fermented foods produces more dramatic shifts. You see tremendous more, uh, tremendous increase in diversity, particularly much more uh, movement in the firmicutus class, and that's also associated with reduced markers of uh, post-inflammatory uh, cytokines. And uh, when you start going from dietary macronutrients to actual diet, you can start seeing some significant changes as well. So this on the left is data from uh, both. Uh, so this is a group out of both the UK, uh, working with Rinz Wiersma at uh, the NKI. And what they did was essentially, uh, they also published a paper in Nature Medicine. Uh, there were three papers published at the same time, ours, theirs, and the CAR-T paper. And uh, Rinz has essentially got a cohort uh, out of the UK. It's known as a PRIM cohort. It's a, there's a Dutch cohort, it's called PRIM-NL, and a UK cohort called PRIM-UK. And this is basically a longitudinal cohort of checkpoint inhibitor treated patients and whom they have prospective biomarker collection, including dietary surveys. Now, as it turns out, if you have a dietary survey, people have developed ways in which you can go from dietary surveys to food indices. So what does that mean, right? So what it means is if I administer a dietary survey to you 
So randomly, just to pick on somebody, Mike. Uh, I can figure out if Mike is adherent to a Mediterranean diet by taking what he's eating and converting that into an index. You can think of this as going from weight and height to BMI. You're taking something and you're converting it into a uh, ordinal variable. So it's got rank. And what you're really doing when you do that is you're taking certain food groups, you're scoring them, giving them a certain weight, either positive or negative, and you're reporting that score. Uh, generally, the uh, and you know, needless to say, the the entire cardiovascular space has done this, you know, for 20 years, and so they've already developed these indices, and these indices have therefore been developed primarily, you know, from a cardiovascular bias for the Mediterranean diet, but also for the healthy uh, plant-based diet, so what is known as a PDI or Plant Dietary Index. And so what they showed was that uh, <clears throat> when they looked at their score, and very interestingly, you could ask how many variables are there in the score, and the short answer is the score goes from zero to nine. So why is it from zero to five? Well, that's a separate question, but the uh, short answer is that they were able to show that there's a, a very nice association between uh, response or the probability of response in this cohort and increasing intake of uh, Mediterranean diet associated food. So again, key thing here, this is not the Mediterranean diet. It's eating like the Mediterranean diet, and it is associated with increasing probability of response. So we've done, you know, we are now, uh, we've, in parallel, we've been working on a much larger cohort. We're using a validated questionnaire known as the DHQ3, which is validated for um, uh, the American diet. Um, and this work is being done by a talented uh, graduate student and in, 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 in who works with me in our lab, and her name is uh, Maddie. And we are not just interested in looking at checkpoint and habit of monotherapy. We're also interested in looking at, so besides PD-1, but PD-1 lag-3, PD-1 CTLA-4, and other cancers besides melanoma, and correlating that with circulating and metabolite and proteomic analysis. So in some very preliminary data, uh, just the lag-3 data alone, there's a very strong association. So you can see that when you score people from minus 1 to 6, uh, really the score goes from minus 1, uh, minus 2 all the way to 8, um, uh, because there are nine groups, so minus 2 all the way to uh, eight. Um, uh, we do see people with very low scores. So that's, again, that's a reflection of, the, of where we live, right? So I live in the Midwest, and they're clearly people who subsist entirely on lunch and meat, right? That's all they have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and diet coke. And uh, despite that, there is, as you start adhering a diet uh, closer to what would, what would uh, one would consider Mediterranean, you tend to do a little better. Uh, the key word is tend, and the key word is adhere. So this is not saying that taking the Mediterranean diet is going to transform a non-responder to a responder. It's an association, right? But it's clearly, it's now seen as PD-1 like 3, it's been shown as PD-1. We have data about PD-1 CTLA-4, and we're really interested in the why, when, and how of this underlying association. Now, um, finally, to the bacteria. This is the area that is most interesting. So how did all of this really start? So in 2015, right, Tom Gievsky and... Laurence published these, these two papers, which have now been cited more than a thousand times, right? And they were really looking at um, mice that were pre-treated, uh, that were treated with uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy, in this case, CTLA-4. And the interesting thing is CTLA-4, uh, as opposed to, say, PD-1. Primarily in 2015, because PD-1 is not actually out there. And uh, in Tom's case, at least, what he was doing was he was really working in a model system because he had observed a difference. So he had jack mice and he had tack mice, and anybody has ever met Tom, you know that he's extraordinarily bright. And he observed a difference, and the difference was that mice in one setting grew slower. So most of us would have yelled at the grad student, Tom didn't. Tom said, you know, is there a biological difference? And he found that there was. And it, it turned out the difference was eliminated upon co-housing, suggesting that the difference was transmittable. And mice, much like children, have no trouble transmitting their poop to each other. So the key thing was, uh, idea that he had was that this is something that is a transmissible factor suggesting that it was something like a microorganism. So all of that started in 2015, but the work was actually even before that. So if you think about it, if you go back about 15 years or so, in the 2008 to 2012 period, the microbiome, the gut microbiome, the constituents of the gut microbiome have been linked to the outcomes of immunogenic chemotherapy. Paper by Laurence looking at breast cancer models with taxol. A uh, paper by, uh, in 2011 by George Kincary looking at uh, the effects of immunogenic TLR9 plus minus oxaliplatin and showing that the administration of certain key bugs uh, can, is associated with the response and that you lose the response in a TLR4 knockout model. So the idea that bugs are important for chemotherapy was sort of out there, but it really only took uh, hold when you had checkpoint because, you know, it was the drugs were exciting, 
And the, the PD1 story really started in 2015 with these three papers. So the first paper was uh, Jen's paper. Uh, so MD Anderson cohort, about 45 patients, permacutis and bacterial diversity. Second paper was uh, the French cohort, so Laurence and Bertrand, showing that uh, in non-small cell lung cancer and RCC, responders had a slight, uh, slight uh, increase in uh, acromancy and permacutis. And then the middle paper is from Tom, showing that respondents had slight amount of bifidobacterium, and Tom was able to recapitulate that preclinically by adding bifidobacterium back into, into mice, into avatar mice, and showing that that appeared to work. But the key thing here is three different cohorts, three different locations. The bugs are not the same. So as we start, started thinking about this problem, there was a meta, um, a, a sort of a meta-analysis. This was really a, no, a, it's not a true meta-analysis in that they didn't use, uh, they didn't reanalyze the primary data, but Cynthia Spears and Pfizer Sheikh, who actually is a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh and is now at Johns Hopkins, uh, essentially looked at all of these um, at, at, at all of these data uh, and about seven papers. And really what they did was they tried to tease out at the level of the source whether or not there were certain associations with response and non-response. And what they found, interestingly enough, was that the source level data consistently identified non-responder signatures rather than responder signatures. So how do you tell that? Well, the idea is that if you look at the heterogeneity analysis in the forest plot, the proportion of lines that end up on one side of the, of the line of unity is greater. It's more consistent for the bugs than it is for across the other line. And that suggests that the non-responder signatures are more consistent than the responder signatures. So we, were, we took two, these two observations and we asked, why might this be the case? How do you explain the fact that all these three groups, pretty well known, are having different, are finding different things, and the meta-analysis appear to be different? So what we did was we looked at, we looked at the cohort. And the first thing you identified is when you look at where uh, Cynthia and Faiza got their data from, uh, you know, again, as oncologists, we see this, but non-oncologists may not see this. But firstly, the sample sizes are tiny, right? So we're talking about cohorts that on average have less than 50 patients. The largest one was uh, uh, Bertrand's cohort, which had about 150 patients. So this was both non-small cell cancer, lung cancer and renal cell cancer. And it did not, uh, when you broke it down by each histology, it was less than half that. The collection time point is very variable, but very importantly, the definition of how you look at responder and non-responder was not the same. So as an oncologist, that's like the first thing that strikes you, right? Your definition of good and bad, how you what you just use to describe the positive and the negative control is not the same from study to study. But also, interestingly enough, the sequencing methodology and taxonomic methods were not the same. So as as, as if you start doing a lot of this work and you gain some familiarity with bacterial sequencing, sequence alignment. What One of the biggest criticisms that this field has is that the taxonomic uh, classification of these bugs is not perfect. Uh, and I'll come back to this a little later, but I'll just give you a quick example. So most of us work with RNA seq right? And we think about how you align RNA seq data. It's pretty simple. You have a sequence, you align the code, you, you get your data, you sequence it, you align it, you do a certain amount of batch, you try to avoid batch effect by doing everything in one go. And after you align it, you tend not to have to worry about what to do post-alignment, except for some minor modifications, depending on the depth of sequencing. But that is a, that assumption comes from the fact that your large variety of your transcripts have accurate host reads, right? Because you're aligning it reference to a host database. The key thing to understand about bacterial host databases, right, is that bacterial host databases are only partial. What does that mean? It means that our definition of E. coli is based on one aspect of E. coli, probably the wall structure, LPS. Our definition of a rare organism is even less ideal. And the, this is therefore got more in akin to, for example, the way in which the uh, people who work in, in astronomy think of you know, what happens out there in space time, because they have to work with unknown unknowns, right? So in the human space, we're oftentimes working with known knowns. But in the bacterial space, we're working with lots of unknown unknowns, because many of these bacteria are not completely sequenced. Many of the bacteria that even when they are sequenced have taxonomic changes that align, that change from database to database. And finally, very, very certain important bacteria undergo reclassification all the time based on certain key, for example, um, um, profiles in, in uh, key enzymes that are involved in bacterial carbohydrate processing or protein processing, for example. So as a result of that, the sequencing methodology and the taxonomic classification are very, very important, but they're also prone to change. 
So what we did was we basically did, to try to avoid this, we did two things. The first thing was we got our own cohort. So we had a cohort of about 100 patients, and we, we said 100 because that would be double what everybody else's was. But we also reanalyzed the existing data using source-level metadata. Uh, but to avoid the whole uh, nonsense that came with response assessment of this investigator and that investigator, we just used a time-to-event endpoint. And um, we sequenced all the samples uh, deeply using both uh, 16S and shotgun and um, classified, you know, uh, response using time to event and also looked at um, pathway analysis. Uh, and I'll show you some of that data as well. So the first thing that we identified was, you know, when you do all of the sequencing, you get a lot of very nice information, but we were able to uh, say pretty conclusively that the depth of sequencing did not matter. Like you could look at responders and you can look at non-responders and reclassified responders and non-responders. In 2020, uh, when this paper was initially described, in 2022, when this paper was originally published, we started developing this idea of a time-to-event analysis. So what is known as one-year PFS or uh, a landmark analysis. And in our uh, landmark analysis, what we were able to identify was that the maximal impact of the composition upon the separation of the curve was at about the 6 to 12, but really the 9 to 10 month mark. And why this is important, I'll come back to later. But how are you getting this? Well, essentially what you're doing is this is much like a UMAP, right? So essentially it's no different from any other single cell paper. But what you're looking at is the separation of the centroid. So for the people in the, in the room who are familiar with, you know, single cell RNA-seq data, I won't belabor this, but for the people who aren't, it's kind of like saying, what if there's a biological parameter that I'm trying to track? And I want to look at the importance of that biological parameter in my host group in question. So the analogy that I tend to use is, what if there, what if there were aliens? And aliens looked at humans and said, oh, you know what, between the ages of 9 and 15, humans appear to undergo something fundamentally different. They appear to gain more weight and they appear to grow taller. That implies that there is a change in what I'm measuring, what the alien is measuring, is the change in the uh, size of clothes that human beings appear to wear. So that infers biological importance. And what, in this case, we all know that to be is puberty. But what you can do is by looking at a separation in two groups, you can infer something important about that group. So you're really separating the proportion of respondents and non-respondents at any given time relative to their bacterial composition at the get-go. And what you can see here is that the distance between the centroids appears to kind of peak. And we came up with a new statistic. Um, I use this term, we came up with this new statistic. Um, but all that we really did was we plotted what is known as inverse permanovas. Inverse permanova. So permanova is basically a separation. And we looked at the inverse to see, you know, what it, uh, make it a little bit uh, broader. And what you can see is that at a very high level of significance, this inverse permanent separates the two groups at about the 10 month mark. Uh, needless to say, when you look at responders and non-responders, you identify a lot of the bugs that other people have already identified. So the uh, responders are here in blue. You find a lot of blaudia. You find a lot of uh, ruminococcus. So these are organisms that belong to the uh, Firmicutes family. And amongst the non-responders, you find a lot of organisms that are re related to Prevotella, as well as uh, Intestimonas and Oscillobacter. So these are really uh, gram-negative rods in particular. And why this is important, I'll, I'll explain in a bit. But uh, as we start thinking about why this might be the case, we had a parallel story that we were developing, which was our work in advanced cancer. And we had this idea that uh, the myeloid cell compartment might be important. Now, again, in the context of a you know, uh, largely ad hoc uh, microbiome collected cohort, we did not have as much pretreatment plasma or serum that we would have liked to do deep metabolite analysis on. Now, that has obviously changed going forward, but at in 2019, when we were working on this, we didn't have this. But what we kind of sort of knew was that the myeloid program appeared to be important in mediating the effect of adverse microorganisms. And so we started looking at what other people were doing. And certainly, Kurt and the Genentech group, so this is data from the Genentech group, and uh, in this trial, essentially what the Genentech group did was basically look at pretreatment levels of plasma islate, and they showed that high levels of plasma islate were associated with bad outcomes. Kurt Schalper did the exact same thing, and he looked at four different clinical trials, melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, non-small cell lung cancer, squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, non-squamous. And in every single trial, high levels of islate were associated with bad uh, or poor response, poor overall survival. But interestingly, Kurt was actually able to link the high levels of ILA to an intratumoral myeloid program that he was able to 
link as being the underlying factor that is associated with checkpoint inhibitor non-response. We then said that, you know what, we don't have high levels of IL-8, but we have a good biomarker that is very close to IL-8. And there is this idea of this peripheral neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio that everybody and their mother has already looked at. I mean, anybody who's got a resident has, has been working on this for like 10 years. And this has been well known. This is data from Paolo Ashiro with a very large cohort of about uh, uh, almost 800 patients that in where he's showing very starkly high versus low NLR is associated with bad versus good outcomes. And so we did the exact same thing. We said, we don't have IL-8, but we have a close cheap proxy. It's in somebody's CBC. Let's just, let's just look at that. So we looked at that. And needless to say, the non-responders and the responders, what we call progressives and non-progressives, had distinct um, metagenomes when you looked at them by high and low NLR. And the vast majority of uh, non-responders were in the high NLR group. And the vast majority of non-progressives uh, or responders were in the low NLR, NLR group. And most of the high NLR people had the gram negative rod that we identified earlier as being associated with non response. So, what we did was we did exfoliome analysis. So, exfoliome analysis, you have stool, right? So, when you have stool, you're essentially doing shotgun metagenomic analysis, and that's simple enough to do. But what you can also do is you can do what is known as exfoliome analysis, where you take the sequence data that you already have and you realign it with a human um, data set. Meaning you take the sequences that you've obtained, which are, you know, sequences of both bacterial and human data. You've already sequenced everything. Now you can realign the exact same thing to a human reference data set. And you now have a sense of what the inflammatory shed cells are. So why do people do this? Well, actually, this idea comes from actually the pediatric literature. So in pediatric necrotizing enterocolitis, for example, people have looked at... Uh, Again, why do you do this in pediatrics? Well, you know, again, if you're dealing with a neonate, you can't really go and do biopsies in the gut, can't really do a colonoscopy. You do have stool samples. Uh, and in order to try to tease out what the component of the bacteria was causing necrotizing enterocolitis, people have looked at this entity of exfoliome analysis. So the question that we had was, we know which bugs are present in people who are doing well and not doing well. We know uh, that this is probably linked to a circulating myeloid uh, phenotype. We don't have tumor. Can we link this using some kind of host profile? And the closest that we had was the shed host cell. So what we did was we used this technique borrowed from the pediatric literature known as the exfoliome analysis, which is, again, basically RNA sequence tool. And what you can do is when you do that, you firstly can look at both the transcripts, but you can also look at uh, SS, uh, GSEA analysis and then start looking at the cell type. And what is very clearly present is that within the non-progressives or responders, you start seeing much more uh, of certain key uh, substances. These genes, that these transcripts that are associated with uh, non-progressives are transcripts that are associated with mucin production and apolipoprotein. In progressives, you see much more inflammatory cytokines and certain key transcription factors such as LCAP, IL-1 beta, and CXCL8. And when you do, you know, uh, IPA analysis, all of this links via, mostly probably via IL-1, B, and CXL8 to a central pathway that actually connects back to lipopolysaccharide. And lipopolysaccharide is very interesting to us because one, lipopolysaccharide is key constituent of gram-negative cell wall. And lipopolysaccharide has been shown, firstly, it's not the same. You use the term LPS as if it's one thing, but lipopolysaccharide is actually very distinct from bacteria to bacteria and has been shown to have its own antigenicity. And what we believe is that uh, that, that different uh, bacteria have different ability to pro provoke a host-based myeloid CXL8 mediated TNF alpha and NF kappa B dependent myeloid inflammatory state. And depending on the tone of the bugs that are present, you're more shifted in one direction versus the other. Now, can you modulate this? That's a subject for a different discussion, which I'll come to. But this appears to be an observation that has now been linked in several other papers, because you know Jen had a recent paper, and in her paper that was just published in Nature Medicine, first author is Andrews. What you'll see is that non-response to PD1 CTLA4 was associated with IL-1 beta and NF kappa B. And it's also not surprising that when you think of what we use to try to reverse toxicity in this space, we're using several of uh, several key molecular uh, monoclonal antibodies that target some of these pathways, particularly, for example, IL-1 beta. Uh, we were also interested in identifying gene sets, right? So beyond, as we start moving past bugs that are associated with response and non-response, we want to, we've said that, you know, 
the taxonomy of these bugs is ever changing and ever prone to reclassification. So maybe the transposable elements of these microorganisms, the genes that are present that we know that the bacteria can change back and forth, these might be important. So what we did was we did uh, a analysis in we uh, what in, in which what we did was we looked at the microorganisms, but we did what is known as reference independent binning. So what does this mean? Well, you know, again, when you think of what you're doing in a human, uh, you more or less know that these are reference data sets. This is what, for example, is present within a myeloid cell program. So for example, the people who work in the single cell space, if you have a single cell um, a library or single cell uh, analysis of published data, you can say, okay, if I'm reanalyzing my single cell data, and there's this published uh, single cell uh, trove from a well-published group, I can use my hope, my, my reads, realign them with you know, those reads and say that, okay, you know, this is the proportion of patients with macrophages with this phenotype or uh, TCF1 positive T cells with this phenotype. I can use published data to do that. The problem with the bacterial data sets is these references do not exist. So binning has to be done in a reference independent fashion. Now, so that in itself involves a separate technique, which I can talk about in EP. But what we did was we did batch corrected pools, microbiota reanalysis using a reference independent binning process. And we were able to identify a couple of key genes, right? So the key points here are that the stuff that is associated with the genes that are associated with good outcomes are genes that help you uh, heal the gut. So genes that are important with uh, iron transport and iron induced rot that are important in mucosal healing genes that are important in riboflavin and riboflavin byproduct metabolism that are important for the antigen presentation by MR1 restricted B cells and mate cells. And uh, uh, progressors and non-responders have genes that are associated with mucus degradation, but also LPS synthesis, which is associated with uh, immune evasion. So we did that work and that was then published uh, about um, a year ago now. And in that same paper, we were very interested in looking at side effects as well. And as we started looking at side effects, you could say, you know, why are we interested in side effects? And you know, really the idea behind that is that the inflammatory uh, nature of certain key side effects is actually being well described. Um, and the association between inflammatory side effects that are related to uh, certain altered pathologies appears to have an underlying microbiome component. So in data from inflammatory bowel disease, uh, ICI compared to say um, patients with I IBD such as UC and inflammatory colitis is associated with a T cell T program that has got a couple of key features, uh, particularly a resident memory phenotype and also a myeloid phenotype. This is data from a uh, German group and this is data from a uh, high witchapenix group in Boston. And what's similar across the board is one, that association with T cells, but two, the association with myeloid cells, but particularly TNF, IL-1, beta, and in this case, osteopontin, but TNF and IL-1 beta, as you've seen earlier, we were able to identify as well. And uh, the idea that the gut microbiome is associated with colitis is, was known back at, uh, about seven years ago in data from Judd Wolchok when he started working with just CTLA-4, he, he found that the people who developed colitis appeared to have uh, microorganisms, uh, gut microbiota that were rich, enriched for bacteroidetes. And the presence of bacteroidetes, uh, specifically uh, uh, species, uh, was associated with colitis and the presence of other gram-positive rods, particularly Firmicutes, uh, uh, certain key Fecalibacterium, and several uh, Firmicutes uh, species, uh, several Firmicutes members of the Clostridium class were associated with favorable outcomes to CTLA-4 fetus melanoma. So when we looked at side effects, again, when you look at a two-group analysis, you find that the metagenomes of people with and without side effects with side effects in orange, without side effects in green, is very distinct. And you can start developing classifiers, right? So in just a simple heat map, you grade all the classifiers at the bottom. So there's a thyroid problem, skin problems, neurological problems, um, joint problems, colitis. And I, I'm, where I really want to bring people's maybe attention to the uh, skin problem, which is down here, and the colitis, uh, which is down here, and the arthritis, which is down here. And I'll, I'll explain why I think that is interesting in a minute. But the short answer is that you can identify certain key signatures of uh, different immune-related adverse events based on the bacteria. Uh, and there, this is, there's some IP around this. Uh, and uh, what's very interesting as we started doing this was we realized that, you know, we can replicate the data about colitis, but, you know, it's already been out there. There are links between colitis and 
a inflammatory program associated with myeloid cells. But we were very puzzled when we saw the data between arthritis and streptococcus. And the reason is because streptococcus is actually not a gut commensal. So streptococcus is a pathobiont. It's not a native gut commensal. You're not supposed to be seeing streptococcus in your gut uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, streptococcus is actually a, a, a microorganism that is killed by acid. So it can't survive in a, in a low pH environment. And you can't get to the gut uh, because it should be killed by the stomach. So the only way for uh, streptococcus, which is an oral commensal, to get to the gut is if somehow the gut pH is raised by, in the stomach because otherwise it can't make that transit. The second thing is that streptococcus, again, is well known to have all these, you know, immune-related features, right? So streptococcus, post-strep glomerulonephritis, these phenotypes of arthritis and so on and so forth with rheumatoid arthritis. And so we were very surprised when we saw streptococcus. And the first question that we had uh, when we saw streptococcus was, you know what, if it's not supposed to be there, how did it get there? And two, if it's something to do with transversing the gastric pH system, could gastric acid suppression be the factor behind why this might be the case. And the reason that's kind of sort of interesting is because parallel to all of this, many of our colleagues have published that PPIs are associated with bad outcomes to checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And there was this link. So we said, you know what, let's go look at this. So we found that we, you know, much like everybody else has shown that when you develop side effects, you tend to do a little better. But there was this controversial data at the time because uh, uh, Carolyn, uh, Carolyn Robey at, at IGR had suggested in this very large, you know, retrospective analysis, all the keynote studies in melanoma, so 001 and 006, that when you correct for <clears throat> lead time bias, the uh, survival benefit of developing immune-related adverse events appears to disappear. So we had this hypothesis that, you know, maybe it might be due to this imbalance between some side effects. So maybe some side effects are good. And some side effects are less good if they're associated with microorganisms that aren't good. So what we did was we, we found that generally speaking, all side effects, you know, the development of side effects in general was favorable. But very interestingly, when you look at high versus low strep and you looked at side effects, that survival difference appeared to switch. What that means is that high strep appears to be bad and it is associated with poor outcomes. And it may explain some of the previous uh, uh, findings. And when we start started thinking that we had this PPI story and PPIs are known to be terrible. But when we looked at that PPI used with our strep patients, we found that there was overwhelming strep predi uh, predisposition with one or two particular immune-related adverse events. So particularly joint problems, you know, not particularly surprising, but also very interestingly, hepatitis. And the idea behind actually the gut microbiome and actually worsening you know, um, um, inflammatory states in the abdomen actually being described in the cirrhotic literature. So if you go back and you look at, you know, cirrhosis data, what they'll tell you is that what the, the, the GI people believe is that PPIs are needed for everybody with cirrhosis because these patients are tremendously prone to varices. But when you look at the patients who develop varices after they're on PPIs, there is a, a unfortunate tragic uh, association between adverse outcomes and the people on PPIs who develop gut oralization. So that phenomenon of oralization is what the people in the GI literature used to describe bacteria going from the uh, from the mouth into the gut, transversing the low gastric pH state. And that oralization, after you correct for you know all the other numerous comorbidities that happen to people with bad cirrhosis, appears to be uh, associated with bad outcomes. But in our analysis, strep was associated with clearly different sets of side effects, and Unsurprisingly, it was associated with PPI. And we think that this is probably something to do with the level of the host. So not everybody is going to do poorly, but there was this lovely science immunology paper that looked at essentially certain key HLA DR4 alleles, right? So not everybody is going to do poorly when you have strep. Not everybody with strep is going to do poorly. And not everybody who develops certain key side effects necessarily has strep because there are people out there developing side effects without strep. But what we think is probably happening is that there are certain key HLA haplotypes that are interacting with certain key microorganisms to do with shared susceptibility epitopes. So particularly the DR4 uh, epitope uh, is of interest to us. And we, right now we are working in um, using both the patient samples and also preclinical samples, but very hard to get tissue from inflammatory uh, patients. So we're looking at literally joint tissue and synovial fluid to try to see whether we can make that link between bugs, the host inflammatory phenotype, 
and the host susceptibility phenotypes. You see there's a link why, as to why certain hosts are more likely to get this compared to others. So, you know, if you find that the microbiome appears to be associated between good and bad, and if you find that it's associated with side effects, enough talk, can you actually do something about it? So that's another area that we're very interested in because as a translational oncologist, it's one thing to describe, it's another thing to actually go and do something to try to improve people's outcomes. So there's a whole way of doing this, a whole host of things that are going on in the space. So people are doing fecal microbiome transplant trials, people are doing consortia, people are doing five uh, dietary interventions. It's certainly monoclonal microbial candidates where you take a single, uh, literally a single bug and you try to give that to people. So this is data from uh, my colleague at the city of Hope. Uh, and uh, this is a very nice data in which we've shown that uh, the addition of CBM588 appears to improve the likelihood of response to Ipinevo. Uh, but we were very interested in literally changing species at a global level. And so what we did was we did fecal microbiome transplant trials. So again, uh, Jen had suggested that you know, you could do this and you can alter the gut microbiome wholly in order to affect benefit. Our question was, it's one thing to do it in mice. Can you do this in humans? So we set out to do this. So the way the trial was designed, uh, let me just skip ahead in the interest of time. So the way the trial was designed, uh, so this started in 2017. And in 2017, there, you know, there wasn't a heck of a lot of people out there trying to give people, uh, you know, fecal transplants to treat immunotherapy resistance, right? So, uh, the biggest takeaway from this is if you ever have a novel idea, uh, your biggest, you think that the people that you have to convince are patients. It turns out patients are the easiest people to convince. The hardest people to convince actually the FDA. And, um, and um, in some ways, you know, you have, to, you have to overcome the resistance uh, and you have to convince your colleagues. Uh, the FDA actually at this time was, was very um, interested in this approach, uh, primarily because up until 2017 when this was, was done, uh, the only rational uses of fecal transplantation was to treat refractory C. diff, for which it was IND exempt. So for reasons that literally make no sense, in 2007, the FDA said, we will not regulate FMT. And that resulted in basically an Amazon Inc. approach to doing fecal transplants for the indication of refractory C. diff. So you could literally buy the stuff on Amazon, get somebody's stool, get a blender. You don't want to use a blender, you don't have to, and try to administer this yourself. Not, you know, for the faint of heart, probably not recommended, probably should come as a giant warning sticker, but it was being done because the FDA had not regulated it. So therefore, when you came to the FDA with this idea, their instinct is to overcorrect, right? So you go to the FDA and say, hey, you want to give people with cancer a fecal transplant. Our patients are not immunosuppressed, right? They're not getting chemotherapy. They have not received, uh, they're not in any way myelosuppressed. And the FDA says, go test for everything. So go test for 35 different microorganisms, some of which are not even known to be um, are not likely to be prevalent in a, a healthy human patient population, or even a patient population with cancer that has been treated with immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So what we had to do is we literally had to screen for all of these things. And this is a, a giant pain. Uh, so the short answer is what it, it, it was important to do. It was important to do because it, it's proof of principle, one, that you can do it. Two, by doing this, you know, we now had, you know, one of the fellows had a paper that was just published in which we showed that, you know, uh, we were doing uh, thorough testing for all of this stuff on every stool set, right? So we had a we had a, we literally had a program, right, in which the research coordinator would call the donor, and the donor were durable checkpoint inhibitor treated patients with these durable responses that were well survival follow up, just coming in for the annuals, and we told them come in, give us a stool specimen. Oh, by the way, we need one specimen every you know couple of weeks, so please come in and give us a stool specimen every couple of weeks. Uh, and in order to compensate you for your time, we'll give you a $25 giant eagle gift card. Um, and by the way, you know, we'll need to test your stool for stuff. So we tested their stool for stuff. We also needed to test their blood for stuff because the FDA said, you know, you can't be transplanting stool from somebody who's HIV positive. And they're like, you know, we're not treating HIV positive people with checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And even if we do, we know it. But the FDA says you have to test. So we were doing HIV tests, hepatitis B tests, hepatitis C tests, HDLV tests. And then after 2018, SARS coronavirus testing on every single stool specimen and the host. So SARS-CoV testing on the stool and the patient's nasopharyngeal swab. In addition to that, we're testing with things like Campylobacter and viruses. But as annoying as all of this was, what it allowed us to do was we had a subsequent paper that is now out there in which we showed that, you know, the prevalence of this is extraordinarily low in a healthy human patient population. In fact, the published, uh, the data that we published uh, in a follow-up paper, 
uh, we were able to establish what the prevalences are like in in a you know cancer cohort. So even in a healthy uh, cancer checkpoint inhibitor treated melanoma cohort, the seroprevalence prevalence of uh, uh, particularly the things that are considered important, which is things like EBV and CMV, is actually lower than blood banks. You know, and the reason that's very interesting is because if you're out there and you're trying to do this, meaning if you're out there trying to create a stool bank for the purposes of uh, treating cancer patients, again, that's not something with a faint of heart, but if you're trying to do that, you can use our data and say that, you know what, we do not want to test every single specimen. And actually in the subsequent trials that I'll describe, we're now able to convince the FDA to do what is known as bookend testing. You start at the front, you start at the end, and that's the, F the blood bank approach. You test once, you test at the end, you quarantine everything during a period, and after you clear the first round, you're, you know, you're kind of good to go. But up in 2017, bookend testing was not a thing. So we were literally testing every single patient. All of these patients were primary refractory. So we picked the primary refractory patient population because we, this is a proof of concept experiment, right? So primary refractoriness is the idea that if you give somebody a checkpoint inhibitor, uh, checkpoint inhibitor, you do a CAT scan at three months, but you know, 20% of the time, the CAT scan is going, going to show shrinkage. 30% of the time, it's going to show growth. Um, the rest of the time, it's going to show stable disease. But of those patients with stable disease or uh, growth, those people, some of those people may eventually convert the, you know, what is known as uh, pseudo progression rate in, with PD-1 is low. But most of those patients will essentially keep progressing. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to treat the highest of high risk patients. And so we took the primary refractory patients uh, and we gave them a single fecal transplant told them no antibiotics and said, keep getting the Pembro. And what we found was that, you know, a whole bunch of people progressed, unsurprising. Um, we took them off study, put them onto something else. But very surprisingly, six out of the 15 people we first treated had just disease that slowed down. Some of them disease just stopped growing. So slowing down of uh, disease kinetics. Some had radiographic progress, uh, radiographic uh, rhesus responses that were very rapid or rhesus responses that were slow. And what we found is that many of these people who's had rhesus uh, respond, responses or rhesus non-progression, uh, just stable disease, long-term stable disease, uh, were very durable. And this is an example of a patient that we treated. You know, you can see that over time, he's developed essentially a PR. And what we can say, say is that very interestingly, um, you know, engraftment is key. So in 2021, you know, when this was published, we started saying that engraftment is important. It doesn't make sense to give somebody a transplant if it doesn't take. And again, if you're a transplant in the hematological space, this is not news to you. But if you're somebody working in the solid organ space, you're like scratching your head as to what engraftment means. You're like, oh, this is a new phenomena. But unsurprisingly, you know, if you're giving somebody a microbial product, if that product doesn't take, meaning if you don't find evidence of the transplant in the host after the transplant, it ain't working. And so this is known as, we came up with a statistic, it's known as the Euclidean statistic. And it basically re represents approximation, approximation of the gross composition of the recipient uh, compared to the donor versus not. So away meaning positive means approximation, negative means non-approximation. And as you can see, most of the patients who are responding, all the patients who are res responding have approximation. You can also look at things like bacterial translocation as a proxy for host engraftment. This is essentially uh, work done on serum. Uh, I explained this to, non uh, to physicians as the indirect Coombs test. You're not looking for bacteria, you're looking for tight human immunoglobulin that's bound to bacteria. And you can see that the proportion of patients with bound bacteria, uh, bound immunoglobulin, uh, that is a proxy for bacterial translocation appears to be a greater in responders. But the underlying key point is why. And the host immune phenotype that appears to be important essentially is T cell dependent and also mate cell uh, dependent. And particularly, we go back to that myeloid story where we were able to find that using single cell analysis, that non-responders had essentially much higher levels of CXCL8 producing intratumoral myeloid cells that were diminished uh, after treatment in responders, but not in non-responders. So again, to conclude, why is all of this very exciting to me? So the reason I'm very excited about this is because this is a standard checkpoint inhibitor curve in any PFS analysis of a PD-1 treated cohort. And that is over time, uh, people tend to do well. We're producing durable cures in about a quarter of the patients who treat with PD-1 monotherapy, but third, a third to 50% of our patients fail. And they fail in the first 10 months. And that 10 months is when it appears that the gut microbiome appears to be most important. So what we think is probably happening is that the gut microbiome is not like CMV. It's not like interferon gamma. It's a supportive tool. It's there. It helps. You can change it, as we've shown. Uh, but it helps support the development of a favorable T-cell response, probably by 
preventing adverse myeloid cells from exerting too much of a significant effect. And there's not much that you can really do about it uh, outside of a full-scale transplantation, though that will change in the future. Uh, but right now, we are still at the stages in which we can show these positive associations and link this now with other cancers. And what we think is that happening is that these beneficial microbes are cooperating with other tumor intrinsic factors. The detrimental microbes appear to be exerting an effect primarily by supporting a myeloid gene effect. So the next step of our analysis is to start thinking about whether these metagenomic signatures hold true across treatments and across other tumors. Uh, is there a pharmacodynamic effect of particularly uh, certain key checkpoints, particularly CTLA-4? What is the interplay between the host diet? And what is the association between the gut microbiome and the circulating proteome? And so we've got this very large cohort that we are now currently under analysis. It's a, a subject of a UO1. And uh, you know, this is now being worked on. Uh, we're we are now working on this. We hope to have a paper in about three, uh, three-ish months. Um, we've shown that you can transform non-response in proof of concept experiments. Uh, this is, again, this is proof of concept studies, right? If you want to do this going forward, what we need to do is we need to start thinking about next steps. We know that we're not ready to pick bugs because when you look at what are the bugs that appear to be associated with response, we don't even necessarily agree on all of this across cohorts. And the people that have tried to pick bugs, for example, microbiome-specific consortia, we have not seen um, favorable results, at least at this time. So we're still at the range of proof of concept experiments. Now, these proof of concept experiments that we are doing and others are doing, I'm just highlighting one here. We know that, for example, pembrolizumab and lenvatinib, you know, this is a combination that has got efficacy in refractory melanoma. The frontline study was negative, but the refractory study is, uh, uh, has resulted in NCCN uh, labels. And uh, lenvatinib is a particularly toxic agent. And we know that lenvatinib, TKI-induced lenvatinib toxicity has got uh, some relationship to the gut microbiome. So we are doing a study. Uh, this is a study that's funded. It's funded by Merck, and we also have a UO1 on this. Uh, and we're looking at essentially a randomized institutional trial of uh, pembrolizumab and vatinib plus minus FMT. And in this trial, we were able to implement bookend testing for the FMT product. So you only test once, you test to the end, you quarantine your product. And we've also developed a capsule so that people don't have to keep getting colonoscopy. So people just have to take capsules. We call them crap capsules. Um, we're also very interested in, in looking at CTLA-4 toxicity. So this is a trial that's going through ECOG. Uh, ben and I are the co-chairs of the study. Essentially, it's basically Ipinevo in the second-line setting, building from the SWOG 1616 data set that show that Ipinevo, uh, and this is standard dosing Ipinevo, so ep 3 Nevo one has got about a 29% response rate in, check 28% response rate in refractory melanoma. And uh, can you improve upon that with the addition of a microbiome uh, um, uh, product? We hope to see that, and uh, we're adding healthy donor fecal transplants to this. We also have a study in non-small cell lung cancer. We got a grant from the Gateway Foundation. I have a lung cancer PI because I don't want to be treating any, any patients with lung cancer. I have enough to do, but uh, uh, we'll be, again, using colonoscopy uh, initially and then uh, uh, maintenance crapsules. And its idea is to do it in pdl one positive non-small cell lung cancer. And then, you know, these, these, these key ideas of some of these, cell, these, these administrations are, are very important. Uh, you know, a lot of the work that we have done has gone to uh, identifying some of these key elements. The idea that space is important, uh, you have to create space, you have to ensure and measure engraftment, as I've shown you, and measuring engraftment, ensuring engraftment is important, but measuring engraftment is just as important. And then you can't do these trials in the absence of deep, you know, deep analyses. You cannot do these translational trials without, you know, by just giving patients a fecal transplant. Like, this has just as much an ability to set the field back as it is to take it forward. And so the key aspect of doing these clinical trials is the concurrent heavy translational immunological profiling that is needed to prove why something is working. And so uh, we also have some interventions in uh, checkpoint inhibitor side effects because of you know, the role of side effects in treating this. Uh, this is of huge interest primarily because the next generation of CTLA-4 inhibitors is already up upon us. So there are these new FC active agents that have been created to essentially augment FC status. So IPI primarily bound low affinity. We've got now high affinity FC, but a high affinity FC is associated with more side effects. So we've developed trials around that. Uh, this is a work of, we got some funding from a foundation. We're actually very interested in African-American cohort, particularly from a side effect perspective. Uh, and we've got some foundation uh, from a, a funding from uh, the NIH as well as cures to do this. So with that, I'll stop and I'll take questions because I, I, I did want to leave time for questions because I'm, you know, I, I covered a lot. Uh, 
and this has really been the work of the last three to five years by a huge group of people, not just myself. The group's you know, really very large, basically everybody on this slide and everybody here who's given us money to do all the work of the people on this slide. Uh, and many people who aren't uh, included on this that I would credit if I could, uh, but there's really not enough space on this because it's really been about team science. You know, we've, we've, we've been very fortunate that we've been able to build teams and the teams are really the people that drive this. So it's not just an oncologist, it's the bioinformaticians, the translational immunologists, uh, but also um, the, the ability to have work with systems biologists to move from different model systems, preclinical to clinical, different tissue types, colitis-based specimens to try to answer the question of what the uh, resident memory T cell is doing in the colon and what it's doing in the CTLA-4 treated patient within the tumor. To try to dissect all of this requires a giant army. And again, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of money. But with that, I'll stop and I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Dr. Devar, for a, a really enlightening and, and intellectually inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, be, while you're thinking of your questions, and I already see one, I gotcha. Um, please use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. And please join us next week for Dr. Nicole Schmidt on repurposing statin drugs for head and neck cancer. Um, so let's get started with Ned. So really uh, fascinating talk, lots and lots of data. Uh, plus I have a nano feed processor on, so I could see the slide clicking by. Half seconds of slide. Um, but I ask you two questions related to cause and cause and consequence. Mm -hmm. One is when you look at your data from your uh, people transplant experiment with T1 non responders, you focused on the myeloid stain, the difference to the presumably suppressed myeloid cells. You kind of glossed over the fact that the Q rays were even sort of greater magnitude difference. And is the consequence of having an inflammatory gut microbiota really uh, on cancer immune response is really driven by increased numbers of regulatory T cells, which are a consequence of greater gut inflammation, but have the effect of suppressing systemic inflammation. And the other related cause and consequence question is, you showed early on about slide number eight, uh, acromancia being increased in uh, responders. Yet, when you looked at the effect of, of some of your transplant studies, you made the argument that it was increasing in mucosal health and indeed the mucus layer. Acromancia is clearly driven by mucus, uh, and it's, it is the frequency of acromancia higher because it's degrading the mucus and leading to decreased gut barrier, or is it higher because there's more mucus in general, and it's simply a consequence of, of a greater protective gut? Okay. Let me answer the second question first, the Treg. Um, there's a very interesting link between Treg and the gut microbiome. This link is this link has to be unpacked uh, extensively. There's a lot of work to be done. The problem in, in the limitation of this experimental setup is that you're looking at non responders, right? So if you look at a PD1 non responder cohort in your negative control, you're going to find TRX. In your positive control, you're also going to find TRX uh, because they are non responders. Now, the question that you bring is is one compartment more important than the other? We don't know, right? In the context of what was, was the experiment that was done, which was a non randomized study, which because you can't randomize people in that setting. What we're able to show is that the change that was observed was related to the myeloid compound. And that kind of goes along with many things that we know about certain key bugs. Now, does that mean the TREGs are not important? Absolutely. They're, they're, they're huge, of huge importance. So, where we really want to unpack the TREG story is actually in inflammatory pathology. So, checkpoint inhibitor, check inhibitor therapy, right? 40, something like 40% of the time, depending on the combination, depending on the drug, depending on the disease, you're going to get immune-related adverse events. Now, some of that, those immune-related adverse events, as I've shown you, are going to be related, are going to be associated to some extent by um, certain key microbiota. And some of those probably have no association. So I'd argue that immune-related myocarditis has probably got nothing to do with the gut. One, the heart sterile. Two, you know, uh, Jim Allison has already shown that it's a gene dose effect of CTLA-4 and PD-1. You knock out 
PD1, you knock out CTLA4, certain proportion of the mice are going to get, are going to get, um, are going to get um, uh, myocarditis, inflammatory myocarditis. So, however, colitis is very different. The phenotype of inflammatory colitis has a large aspect that is associated with uh, a destabilization of inflammatory cells, including a huge influx of resident memory T cells, uh, a huge influx of TNF, IL-1 beta, osteopontin producing myeloid cells, as well as T-reg. Now, how the, the T-reg balance shapes the influx of the T cells and the myeloid compartment is something that we want to unpack in this uh, side effect context. And the way we're doing that is one, I found that the, I like working with retrospective virus specimens, but you never get as much as you want when you want them and at the frequency at which you want them. So I prefer to, to do a clinical trial because I get bias specimens when I want them, where I want them, how I want them. And so, you know, you can do a clinical trial like we've done, you get the funding and do the trial in, my, in, in, in checkpoint inhibitor colitis. One, we're solving a problem for patients, but two, we get the gut biopsy. Then on the gut biopsy, both pre-treatment and on-treatment, we assess inflammation. But then we also want to do facial analysis, deep, uh, deep transcriptomic dive using both spatial omics, but also single cell approaches. So to bridge the issue of depth versus uh, breadth with spatial and uh, single cell technologies to try to see how we can answer the question of what the T-regs are doing at that point in time. And the one question that you could also ask at the same time is, if the T-regs are a very important player, what are the in, what is the role of the intra the luminal microbiota, because the, the microbiota present at the gut lumen do interact with the cells that are present within the lamina propria. And that is something else that the, uh, that the analysis will clarify at the level of um, uh, using the colonoscopic biopsy. So I don't mean to pump. What I'm saying right now is that the T-Rec question has not been answered yet, at least by us. We need to do more. And that's the way we're going to answer that question is in the uh, studies that we're doing right now with specimens that we just obtained. The Akamansa question is fascinating. The Akamansa kind of goes back and forth. I have some data. Again, we've already I've shown you guys a lot, and I could show you even more, and it'd be, if anything, maybe a little bit more confusing. Uh, and what I'll, I'll leave you with is this. It's, it's likely to be very context dependent. So for example, what does that mean? When you look at what you've seen with PD-1, the vast majority of what you've seen with PD-1 is actually more or less consistent. Checkpoint inhibitor, when you say PD-1 as a checkpoint, tends to be firmicutes. That's mainly it. CTLA-4 is very different. Bacteroides is actually, bacteroidetes is actually favorably associated with CTLA-4 response uh, to slightly a lower extent toxicity. And that's very interesting because it's got nothing to do with it's got nothing that's never shown up in a PD-1 alone analysis. The only way we were able to tease that out was because one, Jed had that data from CTLA-4 monotherapy treated patients, and so did Laurent. But outside of that, all the uh, bacteroidetes that we've, we've, been, we've been able to see has not come up. I and mean, it's primarily because if you do anything in a patient in the last 10 years, you never gave somebody CTLA-4 monotherapy. However, that's changing. So one, we've got CTLA-4 monotherapy now going to colorectal cancer. So we are working with some of these, some of our colleagues in the colorectal cancer space in the trials that are using FC active ctla 4 from uh, Agenis and also Exilio, because we're very interested in unpacking what the context is and how the context is associated with a bug that you're interested in studying, because it's likely to be very context dependent. So I think Akamansia has a very controversial and complicated role, depending on what it is you're studying, whether it's PD-1, whether it's your histology, and um, we're very interested in asking that mucus question by being able to produce evidence of what the mucus layer is like. How is it present? Is it absent? What is the presence of the metabolites that are present at that time and how are they shifting in patients who do and don't have toxicity and response in these patients? Oh, should we finish for the day or do we have time for one more question? Maggie, you're in charge, Maggie, you tell us. We should finish, okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Var, for an incredible discussion. If you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to him personally, um, and perhaps you can chat via email. Um, thanks for your attendance, and we look forward to seeing you next week.